Dr. Visalakshi, the Honorary Secretary, welcome you all for the new session, the webinar on post-install fastenings from design to execution with state-of-art methods and techniques. Uh, I think this is a very good topic and would be interested for all the field engineers. We all know that how fastening play an important role in connecting different elements or different members as such, okay? And post-installed fastenings are very much essential nowadays for the structural engineers, okay? This, this has triggered by the increasing popularity of the high-strength concrete which we are using or the ultra-performance uh, high-strength concrete which we are using. So this is an apt topic uh, for today's webinar. Okay, so today's program would be a, a webinar on the post-install fastenings, followed by a digital book launch on fastening technologies, the book written by Ms. Kamalika Kundu and Mr. Prashant. Okay, before we uh, move on to the webinar, uh, I would like to introduce the moderator and it's a proud privilege uh, for me to introduce Mr. Vinay Gupta, whom we all know, but as a formality, I'll, I'll, I'll do the introductory part. Uh, Mr. Vinay Gupta is a civil engineer from Bet Spilani, and he's presently the director and CEO of Tandon Consultant Private Limited. Okay. Um, he has contributed a lot to the uh, codal committees of BIS as well as IRC. He has contributed enormously for their updation of the codes. He's a very active member you know, in the technical committees of these codal provisions. Uh, his contributions uh, to the professional organizations is also commendable. He's presently the president of IAB and ICI, a vice president of Asian Concrete Foundation Federation, and also the vice president of uh, IA Strati organization uh, which has been arranging all these webinars also and uh, we are privileged to have uh, Mr. Vinay Gupta as a moderator so now I'll hand over the platform to uh, Vinay ji the platform is yours now we can take through now. Uh, thank you Professor Vizalakshi and uh, I am glad that we have the president of IAS Trakti Mr. Manoj Mittal also with us and a very good evening to you and very good evening to the uh, participants. Uh, we will have a presentation. I'm sure there will be several questions to be answered because this is not a very day-to-day -day kind of a run-of-the-mill stuff that we use. It's completely different. Although it has been there in, in being in India for the last about uh, 20 over years, uh, but still, people do not know enough about it. That's my feeling. Uh, so a little bit about the speaker. The speaker is a very uh, smart person, I must say. He lives in Singapore, Mr. Amol Singh. Uh, he holds a very good designation, which is what uh, impresses me. He is technical marketing manager in Hilti at Singapore. Structural, of course, is also attached to this. Now, why I say is very interesting is, when you meet the marketing person or salesperson, the person hardly understands technical stuff. He tries to give you some answer which may be right, which may be wrong, but he gives you answer because he speaks very well. But when you have a person who's an engineer, who has enough engineering knowledge, and then he's a marketing person, is a fantastic combination to my feeling. So he has, uh, uh, he has uh, with an education and previous working experience as structural engineer, Mr. Amol Singh uh, has been uh, working with Hilti for nearly five years in different roles, providing technical advisory and solutions to structural engineers and designers, engineers and designers in the industry for various fastening applications. In his current role as engineering marketing for the Southeast Asia Pacific region, Ms. Amol continues to provide technical advisory and focuses on highlighting the role fastening play in a structural design. 
with the aim to make the technical details behind fastenings easy to follow for practicing structural engineers. And friends, let me tell you that uh, we in BIS are preparing a code. Hilti is giving us an active participation and active support. And this code is uh, made, already prepared, but it's about to be you know, finalized in the sense that um, it has to go through uh, uh, this uh, public uh, domain for their comments, wide circulation as it's called, and then it has to be printed. Although, of course, uh, today we'll be releasing some book uh, on fastenings, but to have, to have a stamp of BIS, it takes some more process, some more time. Uh, what are these post-installed anchors? Why should I use post-installed anchors? Of course, Mr. Ramol Singh will explain you much better, but I am also speaking the words that I have learned from the Hilti and some other companies. In fact, let me tell you my association with Hilti. I have known Hilti since those times in 1995 when Mr. Mani Sahemi was their CEO. And I've been using Hilti products and of course some other uh, companies' products, also similar products of post-installed fastenings since 1997. So for me, the experience is about 24 years old. Uh, they're very efficient, very effective, and there are many types. That's very uh, useful to understand. Uh, you have already constructed or concreted something which has hardened, which has gained its own strength. Now you want to add something that is post installed. Normally, there are chemical fasteners, there are expansion fasteners, and there are a few other types. In expansion fasteners, it's nothing like you know what people say dash fastener in a very layman's language or a typical mason's language. So here you drill a hole. After drilling a hole, you put this fastener and keep on tightening it into it. It expands, and by expansion, it gives you strength. And it's a magical strength, I must say. But these are structural fasteners that go into the concrete. Other ones are chemical fasteners. There you drill a hole slightly bigger and then you insert some epoxy resin in it, which has a bond strength of 3 to 4 MPa, or if not more. And that goes, and then your uh, some bolt kind of a thing, which is a special bolt by them, goes into this hole. Even there can be reinforcement also, which we call it bones installed rebar fasteners, wherein the rebar can go into the hole and it gives you in the case of rebar, it can give you as much strength as for a rebar, otherwise with a normal lapping or any kind of splicing. And similarly, the chemical fastener with the bolt gives you much higher strength than expansion fasteners. And one thing more interesting, friends, to say that uh, Mr. Amol Singh's father is my next door neighbor. So I have an affiliation with Mr. Amol Singh and of course... Uh, anyway, so with these words, although I've taken too long to introduce uh, this gentleman, but now I'll request Mr. Amol Singh to please go on. All the stage is yours. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. And it's a real pleasure to have been introduced by you. I mean, uh, one could not ask for a, a <laughs> better introduction. So uh, good afternoon once again to all members of the IS Truck team. I hope you're all, you've all been in good health and spirits du during this time. And uh, well, I can honestly say it's a real pleasure to be your presenter this afternoon. And with so many names and faces familiar in the audience, I honestly feel at home. So today I'll provide you with a, uh, an overview on the selection, design and installation of fastenings in, in, in concrete. All right, so let's get into it. So um, in preparation for this webinar, we gathered some questions on post-install fasteners commonly asked by practicing engineers and designers. Members of our audience may have had similar questions in the past. And as I, uh, as I go through them very quickly, you can also read them. Uh, these, you know, you can jog your memory to the times when you face such scenarios. Okay, so, uh, you know, um, Mr. Gupta started with, you know, why do we need fasteners and where do we see them? What different forms exist and how do they work? Uh, and what we also need to know is what are the limits? So how can they fail and how do I design against this failure? So the, the, when you face this scenario, the idea is you know what to do and you are familiar and you know uh, which specific resource to tap when you face the solution. And by this, I, I hope we, we can spur some you know, curiosity on this and I can make you self-sufficient a little bit, at least uh, 
uh, on on this topic. So uh, let's let's jog on and uh, with fasteners or anchors, as you might call them, you know, it's the same thing. We're connecting essentially two objects together. If you look around your own house right now, you find uh, fasteners connecting, you know, various objects such as uh, shelves, television screens, heating vessels, fans, air conditioners, and other interior architectural features to your walls, your floors, your beams, your columns, right? And and let's call these our uh, non-structural uh, components. So if we extrapolate these on a slightly larger scale. We can also connect uh, larger structural elements that participate in ensuring our structural integrity. So, and, and, and a key example of this is obviously, you know, when you fix a steel beam to an existing concrete uh, column. All right. So, uh, now that we, you know, you can see them. Uh, what are some examples of your structural components? Well, of course, you have the the, the foundation where you have the steel column going into the concrete pedestal and you can see them uh, um, the rest of them displayed on the screen and uh, these connections you know would be subject to your larger static and dynamic actions acting over the lifetime of uh, the structure so uh, these uh, connections and the fasteners are the point you know through which the tension and the shear resulting from these actions gets transferred into uh, into the concrete all right so and the idea here is to ensure that we have uh, uh, a connection that acts in unison with the entire structure. So fasteners are also used uh, to fix curtain walls and other facade elements to the main structure, which you know they also form a key part. You can consider them a little bit of a substructure, um, you know, and they transfer their own uh, loads, and the, the wind, the seismic action onto the main structure. All right, so, and then we have non-structural elements and in the non-structural elements or components, you know, we have different, uh, you know, we fix different services. So such as uh, mechanical electrical utilities to the soffits of slabs and beams. We have manufacturing equipment, machinery uh, and so on, which need to be connected to the floor. Uh, and you also have a lot of industrial and engineering uh, energy projects which use uh, such fixings. So once we've identified the component we need to connect to our concrete, we must choose our fastener. And you know, it, it makes little sense to use the, the, same, um, the, the same fastener to connect a structural and a non-structural component. Uh, let me give you an example of this. You know, let's say you're fixing a ceiling fan and uh, you're using an M24 uh, threaded rod with any or any sort of anchor, M24 bolt with it. Well, I mean, you, it's definitely possible, but quite unnecessary for the task. Uh, so before we choose our fastener, we must also be aware where we are in the construction sequence. So for a structure still under design, it's quite natural to look for a cast in place uh, solution, as this would be you know, the most suitable option if positional accuracy can be assured while the concrete is uh, being cast. All right, and cast in place fastenings come in two variants. And the first variant uh, would be your individual bolts or, you know, groups of them, you know, connected with a, with a base plate and they're welded to them. And the other one is your anchor channel. Uh, these ones you might not have been familiar with. These are mostly used in the facade industry, uh, but uh, in the facade connections, but they're still connections nonetheless cast in place. On the other hand, if you if the position cannot be guaranteed, or let's say you know while casting the, the bolts were moved or missed entirely, well then you have the option of uh, the post install uh, fixings as well. So depending on where you are in the sequence, it's uh, it's good. Or let's say you have an existing structure, hence you. Well, obviously, the only way you would have a cast in place is if you uh, drill away and chip away that concrete and then uh, put a bolt in and then redo it. And I don't think that's a very ideal solution. Uh, what you also see on the extreme right of the screen is, is a direct fastening option. So this is essentially a nail that's used uh, to, to fasten. It, it's, it's fixed on a steel element mostly, and, uh, but also you can have concrete and uh, wood as well. And, and then, you know, these are use a powder or a gas actuated tool, uh, kind of like a nail gun, so to speak, to fix. So not mostly used in structural fixings, but uh, in non-structural fixings, it's quite uh, common. So um, 
fasteners are further broken down into other uh, type and variety and there's so much variety available in the market it's quite a daunting task i really do sympathize uh, with the structural engineers today uh, that when they have to pick one they're a bit you know um, it's, it's a bit difficult let's put it that way so if we're looking to connect a new steel uh, element to an existing member and yet and let's use that example throughout the course of the session uh, what makes the selection process easier and narrowed down is is this you know you have existing concrete so you know the casts in place then to go out right and then you will then have the option of either post install mechanical and chemical so at this point uh, imagine that this is your scenario Okay, so to select again the most suitable fasteners, we, we, we narrow down a bit more, uh, so we must understand how they work, and that's one way to narrow it down. And despite the many differences in quality, performance, and application coverage, all anchor technologies, honestly, they have a common ground. And uh, the way in which these uh, uh, systems transfer load onto the substrate uh, is, uh, is one either with one of these three working mechanisms. Yes, you see four, but I will come to that, why it's keying is repeated twice and uh, a combination of the following. So it's either one or a combination of these. So uh, with friction, you have essentially a tensile load end that's being applied on the, on, on the fastener and it's transferred into the base material using uh, by friction. And this is what uh, uh, Mr. Gupta was talking about with the expansion fasteners. That's essentially what's happening here. Uh, and so you need to generate an expansion force on this by applying a torque and reaching that torque is quite crucial. All right. And the next one is the keying, and this is possible via two mechanisms, either undercut. So undercut creates like a little, a large dent at the bottom. So this is done via a special drill or by the fastener itself uh, that, you know, once you start talking it, it, it expands the sleeve and creates that dent. So this is slightly bigger than, uh, than this. And that's what generates the, the resistance R. Um, another option is that you can use uh, screws. So concrete screws work particularly well um, in this. So they're basically on a smaller scale, essentially. And we'll come to that on the next slide. So both of these keying, as the term goes, you know, imagine you're sticking your key into your keyhole as you enter your house and it gets stuck halfway and you're trying to pull it out, right? So that's essentially the action what's happening here. And uh, lastly, we have adhesion or bonding. And this is what you might have been most familiar with. You know, you stick a, a different type of adhesive, whether it's an epoxy or a different mortar, uh, you know, and, and this is what transfers the load from the rod into the concrete. So it acts like an intermediary. And most anchors that you see in the industry available in the market, these work with the combination. Um, so expansion fasteners come in two varieties and uh, so one is activated by displacement this is for example when uh, when you transfer loads into the base material using a special tool well, it's not really that special it's just like a, a little um, steel element that you know uh, a con an installer would hold and then hammer it and there's a little element a metal component on top which pushes down the sleeves and expands it Right. And so that's one uh, aspect. Uh, the other aspect is that you apply a torque and this is what we covered with the expansion fasteners. Let's just have a quick video on how uh, this works. So this is one of these expansion anchors. And as you can see, as the cone pulls up of the anchor, the shank pulls up, the, um, the sleeves expand and generate that, uh, that friction force. Next, uh, we look at the, the classic bottom undercut, right? This is, this is the, the real heavy duty anchors that you want to use if uh, you're transferring a lot of uh, uh, tension and shear. Right, so this creates a, a big dent over here. And rather than talking about it, let me just show you a quick video. And as you can see, apologies for the slightly poor quality of this, uh, but I hope you can make out what, what's happening. So here, the, rather than the cone pulling in, pulling out, uh, so to speak, as you, we were doing with torque, what we're doing here is when you torque it, the sleeve actually expands in over the shank. And this is how you have the undercut. So once it's set, uh, you can start loading it. Screw fasteners on the other hand. So basically you have um, numerous uh, dents. So you can imagine the, the, the threads of the screw. These are your numerous dents. And as they go in, you know, as the, the screw has a cutting head. So that's what allows it to be installed with an impact wrench. And, and that's what you'll see happening uh, over here, right? So that those are the little tiny dents that we see. 
All right. Okay, and then we move on to the chemicals and the chemicals work uh, with uh, not just with bonding, but also with the friction and keying. Uh, but first let's cover the standard mechanism. In the standard mechanism, you have a mortar which adheres to the concrete and to the rod at the same time. And it transfers your force uh, from uh, the, the rod into the concrete. So you can see that uh, there's a bit of micro keying within the, the, the threads of the rod as well. Then we have bonding friction. So this uses a, very, a, a different kind of rod, which has some tapered wedges along the sides. And you can see the, from the blowout that these uh, wedges, once the, the chemical sets, uh, and then when you apply a tension and, and, and the shear force to it, it, it starts pushing against uh, the, the cured mortar over here. So you have a combination of bonding and friction. These are particularly useful when you need to resist high tensile loads and you, don't, and you have sufficient uh, concrete cover uh, to play with. Lastly, we look at keying, and um, I won't touch upon this too much because masonry really deserves its, uh, a section of its own. It, it's quite uh, a different material, and uh, although you know many engineers might not encounter it as frequently as you do concrete, uh, this is one example of where keying plays a role in hollow masonry. And uh, you can see it over here. So you, with the help of a mesh sleeve that's inserted prior to injection, uh, you have uh, what, do you, what do you call like an interlock and or a keying that's created in the voids of the masonry. So if you also have um, hollow, hollow blocks that you're using and if you're fastening something to it, this is one option. But just uh, bear in mind that the masonry generally as a rule tends to be a lot weaker uh, than concrete. So don't expect it to take a lot of uh, forces. So uh, with all these working principles, they translate into the, the resistance of the fastener or, you know, not just one, but it's a group as well. And if insufficient resistance is generated, then we have failure. And with this, before I run through the different failure modes, I want to just um, touch upon one theoretical concept that we need to understand. And that is that concrete can fail in tension. And yes, you know, you heard that correctly. In normal RC design, we typically do not consider the concrete tensile capacity. But as you see here, it really plays an active role. And of course, we never want to exceed this capacity. All right, let's, uh, let's start with the tensile failure modes. Of course, the first one is steel in which, uh, you know, the weakest part of the connection is represented by the rod and failure corresponds to, you know, your typical necking prior to complete failure, complete fracture, right? So in this case, you know, your concrete remains relatively intact. And, and that's, uh, that would be your failure mechanism. I know this is the most desirable one because we always want ductile failure, but I'll touch upon towards the end of this slide why that might not always occur, right? And uh, the concrete cone. So this is, this is the, the main one, right? So after reaching its uh, tensile capacity, you know, the uh, concrete uh, starts forming a cone shape. So if you can follow my cursor on the screen, uh, it, it, there's a fracture surface that starts at the bottom uh, of, of the anchor, so the, towards the end of the embedded part, and it radiates out like a fan uh, shape uh, towards the top edge, so where the, in the direction of the applied tension. Okay, so uh, what, what happens here is this is governed by the crack growth, and the angle, if you're if you're really curious about this, is 35 degrees to the perpendicular, which is uh, quite similar to what you will have in fracture mechanics. So it's a, a similar principles are used here. Right. So this is the most common one you probably encounter when you are designing your anchors. Uh, pull out. So this is uh, quite. Uh, this is only for cast in and mechanical anchors. And here uh, it's it is, it is what it says on the tin. The fastener is pulled out from the drill hole, and it only partially damages the surrounding concrete. So not, you don't have the same effect as a concrete cone. Uh, and so for mechanical fasteners, this means that there's a loss of the frictional force or the keying force. And for chemical anchors, we call it a bond uh, failure or a combined pullout and concrete cone to give it its official term. <laughs> and, and, and that also is a, a slightly tinier um, uh, fracture surface that originates. But the point is it will fail. Then we have a splitting. This failure is caused by hoop stresses around the fastener. Uh, so they generate from the point of, uh, from the bottom, uh, from the top, and they start, you know, narrowing down uh, towards the end, towards the embedded part. And so what this does is it's, it splits the, the concrete in two. 
And uh, this commonly occurs when the dimensions of your concrete component are limited, i.e. when your member is too thin, or when the fastener is installed too close to an edge, or when two fasteners are positioned too close to each other. So this normally happens when you know when you over torque as well. When let's say for the expansion fasteners, you apply a lot of torque. Um, this can split and then ultimately spoil your concrete as well. And lastly, for and this is unique only to casting uh, anchors. Um, and this blowout failure, and it's very interesting because the origin of this failure starts with the high bearing pressure that's generated at the head. So again, this is only for casting, but this head generates quite a bit of. Um, uh, bearing pressure. And this bearing pressure, pressure ends up causing bursting forces perpendicular to the applied loading. So the applied loading direction is tension. And if you follow my cursor, the, the blowout is on the side face. So when does this normally happen? Well, normally this happens when you're really close to an edge and you've embedded the anchor too deep. So uh, you, can, you can calculate what resistance, residual resistance you will have if you do that. So for shear, uh, we, when, if you move on to shear, this is, again, we start with the steel and this is with or without lever arm. So lever arm is just when you have a, when, you're, when your base plate is not in direct contact with the concrete surface. So any little gap, let's say you're pu putting a grout um, or just providing a little bit of a standoff, uh, then uh, this lever arm condition will activate. Uh, and so again, the failure is quite similar. You will have, uh, you know, the rod shearing off after large de deformations. And uh, this is similar to, uh, for example, without lever arm, this is similar to the concrete failure in, I mean, so the, the steel failure in tension, except it occurs at about half the capacity of the steel. All right, so with pry out, uh, this is similar to, you know, if, if, you're, if you're getting the midnight munchies, you know, and you want to go and, uh, you know, take a spoon and get some ice cream uh, and midnight feast, and what you can do then, uh, that's what happens. That action is what pry out really is, right? Or let's say you're digging some earth with a shovel, that's the action. So the fastener over here or the group, it rotates, and then you have a catenary tension force that develops in this fastener. And this is represented by a semi-conical fracture surface that develops in the direction opposite to the applied shear. So the shear is acting this way. What will happen is there will be a, a similar like a little couple that forms here and then it'll scoop out the concrete behind uh, the shear. Now lastly is, and this is the most prominent failure mode uh, when you're designing for shear forces, uh, this is the edge breakout. And what happens here is you have a cone-shaped sur um, fracture surface again that, start, that originates a certain depth down uh, into the anchor, and I'll touch upon this towards the latter part of my presentation, what's that particular depth? And it um, moves towards the free surface or towards your edge. And uh, this really happens when you are really close to an edge. Um, and even if you're really not close to an edge, uh, it, it, it can still happen. So the idea is to guard against uh, these failure modes. So as you can probably tell, a ductile failure, you know, you can never uh, guarantee that you, um, it will happen, but you can take some measures. For example, if you use high strength concrete uh, with in combination with a high performing mortar and you're able to um, space the anchors uh, further apart and the fastener um, steel element is weak enough, then you can guarantee that a, duct, a steel failure or a ductile failure will happen. Uh, but in most instances, uh, that's not the case. Um, and you know, once you start designing, you'll quickly realize that. So um, many parameters influence the performance of these fasteners. Um, and you can see them on the left-hand side of your screen. And uh, so the Let's take one of these examples, and that's the depth, right? So this is quite a, uh, quite a hot topic. So the depth of the fastener is is quite the key performing uh, parameter, performance parameter. So let's use that in our example when we connect our steel base plate to a column. So ideally, we would like to install the fastener as deep as possible to maximize our resistance to cone or bond failure in tension. But on the other hand, if we go too deep, then we might cause the concrete element to split. And this is not ideal. Uh, also, the, the deeper we go, it has no impact on the steel uh, resistance. So the steel resistance is just, you know, your stressed cross section times your uh, the, uh, the strength of the rod and how deep you go has no impact on that. So uh, there, there are, it, depth is not uh, the be all and end all of anchor design. Uh, and it really just is a combination of a lot of parameters that are encapsulated in design.
So when it comes to design, naturally, we want to follow the limit state and just like you do for steel and concrete elements. So this harmonizes really well with um, the current standards in play today. And the design also uses partial safety factors that we apply to characteristic loads and resistances. So let's go back to our example. And uh, let's imagine we are connecting uh, you know, a, a simply supported beam uh, from uh, one column to another. Let's say we want to put a, a concrete, uh, a, like a metal deck on top uh, um, for a profile sheeting. And that's our connection, right? So we need that. So we have um, 100 kilonewton of, uh, of shear. I mean, this is just representative. You can imagine this to be a thousand if you wish. Uh, but we, we have uh, the steel failure is 200 kilonewton. The pry out failure is 120 and the edge failure is 110. So uh, what we want is anything the higher than this, but we need to pick the lowest resistance that decides our design and that's going to be your 110. Okay, so at this point, I'd, I'd like to take a quick detour and say, well, why do we design in, in, in the first place, right? So um, we have seen over the past years, and this is, this is no, I'm not passing any judgment, you know, I was on the same side of the table and we often considering how less frequently, you know, you encountered these scenarios and considering no guidance as of yet uh, in the standards, hopefully, you know, uh, fingers crossed that the uh, BIS publication will be out soon. Um, but at the, in the meantime, we see that there are uh, manufacture catalog, you know, the load tables mentioned and they're being used. And honestly, uh, speaking, speaking the truth, these should not be used uh, at all. These are just indicative and they're just guide, guidelines uh, on certain scenarios, right? I, I would really recommend engineers not to use these. It's good to get an idea but uh, not use it in uh, in your design. Another approach, so this is what two and three talk about. Uh, you can increase the design load or the safety factor on that. Or conversely, you can apply a reduction factor on the fastness performance or whatever you, let's say you see on the table, you apply some reduction and then you, you chuck it in. And another approach is by simply using an approved fastener. Uh, and there is like, okay, so it's approved, it, it'll perform, that's it. So uh, uh, the, the idea is uh, that there are different approaches, uh, but they, they all might not give you the true represent, they might not represent the true performance of the fastening, right? So uh, I also must uh, draw your attention to the bottom statement that I mentioned. So the design is and sometimes is assumed to be the manufacturer's responsibility. Uh, well, yes, of course, the manufacturer can assist engineers by guiding you with the calculations, you know, like that's not, uh, you know, we're not shirking that responsibility one bit, but any guidance would be limited to that particular member or, you know, similar members. Uh, and, they, you know, there, there's no idea behind the design assumptions for the overall structure, whether the existing concrete can even take up all that load uh, and so on. So, but, you know, the idea is to work in tandem uh, when engineers uh, need to design such connections, uh, they, they are quite familiar with the latest standards and can be self-sufficient in doing them. And um, there's, there's often, uh, I want to highlight these uh, unfortunate collapses uh, from Boston to Shanghai to Texas. And I don't want to say these, these are all down to uh, design. There are also issues with installation. For example, the one in Boston is very prominent because for the first time, uh, the issue of creep in chemical anchors was really starkly highlighted and it led to a substantial revision in the, in, in the testing regime for chemical fasteners. Okay, so uh, if right now, since we're working, if we're waiting for the, the IS uh, um, version of the, of the anchor standards to come out, uh, what can we do in the interim? What's the latest guideline that we can follow? Well, there are international guidelines and the state of the art today is the recently introduced Eurocode 2 part four or EN19924 to give it its official designation. I'm going to call it EC24 because it's just easier on the, on the tongue. So it all means the same thing, by the way. And so some of you might have been familiar with its predecessor, ETAG001, and um, that, that was also used by engineers quite, quite until quite recently. And you can still continue to use it today. Does that mean you need to design your entire connection to the European norms? Absolutely not. 
but it's also uh, important to understand the cross linkages and the references that uh, EC2 or Eurocode 24 makes uh, with the different uh, Eurocode standards. And uh, so you can still design the steel elements with IES 800. Yeah, your concrete, of course, uh, with 456. And until you know that gap is plugged, uh, this is the state of the art. Now you also, if you're familiar with ACI design, um, uh, ACI 318, uh, there's, an old, there's another chapter in there as well, dedicated to cast in and post install fasteners. And although the differences between the two are quite minor, uh, EC24 offers a wider scope and more flexibility to designers. And, and for this reason, I'll continue to, uh, to focus on EC24 uh, for this session. Okay, so the overall design pr principles will always remain the same. You know, your ultimate limit state criteria, your serviceability criteria, and what you have in terms of the durability, and that is the fitness for use over the, uh, the lifetime of the structure. So all of these, uh, just as you do for your main structure, these also apply to the fastening as well. So at this stage, what we want to do is understand the specific requirements of the connection. And so let's go back to our example of a you know, um, steel beam to an existing concrete element. What we need to establish is what are the performance requirements uh, needed for the connection, right? So do we need any seismic criteria? Well, looking at most of India, I would say yes. Uh, what's the state of the existing concrete? Do we have, you know, is, is it, can it be drilled into? Can, can the performance, uh, can the fastening, uh, would the fastening work? Uh, what level of corrosion protection? Are we exposing it to the elements or is it going to be one of those interior columns with plenty of fire protection? Because then this impacts your choice of material uh, as well. So whether you want a carbon steel or a stainless steel variety. Uh, any service life requirements? Let's say you're designing this for a civil project. So that would mean normally 120, 100 years or 120 if you're working for metros, that level of requirement. So can it perform until then? Uh, then any fire rating, again, uh, is it going to be exposed to any fire scenarios? then yes, that design is needed. Is the client looking for any lead certification? That also goes part of it. And most importantly, can the existing concrete even resist the additional load? So that check all needs to go. And there are many other things as well. So let's just do a quick recap on what we've covered so far. And um, well, we've covered that fasteners can fail uh, in tension and shear in many different failure modes. And guarding against this failure is uh, quite essential to prevent the loss of life and assets, so building assets and structural collapse. And defining the fastness performance requirements is but the first step. So and in the, uh, until the gap is plugged with the Indian standard for fastening, the state of the art Eurocode 2.4 enables engineers to comprehensively design their custom and post install fixings. All right, so let's see where does the Eurocode sit under the regulatory framework. So this is quite important. And this is not just a standalone um, design, uh, you know, document. This document sits with uh, refers to technical data or ETAs. So these are essentially your fastener approvals, and this is where all the technical data is 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 published. And if you're looking for a single source of truth, this is it. That's what the ETA does. And where does all the data come from uh, in the ETA? Well, that's with the European assessment document. That's where you know all your testing requirements are harmonized in one document. And every uh, company producing anchors has to uh, subject their testing to fasteners if they want an ETA. Okay. Uh, similarly for cast-in, and this, uh, you might not be familiar with this, but there are specialist EADs for ribbed reinforcement steel. So you can see like there's a headed fasteners over here, as well as steel plates with cast-in anchors. Now, no matter, you don't need, you know, if you're using a generic uh, um, headed bolt, uh, there's, there's no particular need as you can follow the default provisions in EC24. Uh, for cast and anchors. Uh, and but what I must draw your attention to is if you are using these EADs, there is no seismic provision contained in them at the moment. So this might change in, in the future. All right, so under the standard, we can design our base plate to different um, design scenarios such as static, seismic, fatigue, or fire. And for that, we need that uh, ETA relevant data, right? So let's say you have um, a static only approved anchor. Well, it's not really useful if you want to put it in seismic, you have no performance data to go by. 
And uh, one thing I want to mention is that uh, the testing is not done in-house by the manufacturer. This is done in external laboratories specifically set up to deal with the demands of testing. So they have all the machinery and the equipment uh, and uh, you know they have a full fledged, they, they make a business out of it too. Um, so these are called technical assessment bodies. And so what they do is they take the ETA documents, uh, they take the anchor subject to all, subjected to all the tests in the EAD and then they publish the ETAs. All right, and of course, you know, uh, un manufacturers cannot claim a perf different performance uh, unless it's tested. Now, I also must uh, emphasize that there are situations which are not mentioned in the EAD, and it often falls up to the manufacturer to do some in-house testing uh, until that you know the the scope of the EAD is is widened. So it's been continuously updated time after time, and. So I want to touch upon this. You know, why, why do I talk about testing a lot? Because um, you know, it, the crucial thing to realize is that these are not standardized construction products like reinforcement steel or, or J bolts or L bolts. You know, typical stuff you'll find in the in the market. Uh, but they still need regulation under a harmonized and uh, uniform assessment criteria, and all the material components must still conform to internationally recognized standards such as the ISOs. And manufacturers, you know, they're not they're not bound to make the exact same type of fastener. And this is undertaken specifically to ensure that the sector remains open to innovation. You can think of it like the automotive sector, for example. You know, the point of any automobile is to transport you safely from point A to B much like the purpose of any fastener is to connect material A to B and safely transfer the loads. But some vehicles make your ride more comfortable. Some vehicles go through potholes without giving you a sore back. And uh, some give you better mileage. And you know there, there are many other features uh, alongside it. So let's say if we had the same bog standard Maruti 800, um, you know, then we wouldn't have all your state of the art, uh, you know, the, you know, your fancy automobiles. And the same can be thought of for fasteners as well. So that's the innovation spur that goes on. But again, once it's tested as well. So it's not like uh, you can, any manufacturer can release uh, any, any anchor and claim, yes, it's the latest, the greatest. It has to go through all these checks. Now, I want to contrast this with what you can get from a test report from a local laboratory. So this will only check the material strength and uh, there's, there's no, uh, audit, uh, no audit or QAQC that's being done um, from by, on the manufacturer side if there, is, uh, if there are these local test reports being used. And, and even more crucially, what's not mentioned on, over here is uh, the pullout tests that are done at site. These only check the quality of installation and workmanship and uh, you know, consistent performance can never be guaranteed with them. And the many important values that we use in the design are established along the testing journey some of which have no theoretical equations that can be used in the design. So for on the left-hand side, you can see, for example, with mechanical fasteners, you know, how can we use the, the how can we know the friction or the expansion force without testing it? And on, on similar vein, you know, you have your, your bonded or your chemical fasteners. Uh, how do we know the bond strength if we don't test for it, right? So again, there, there are no, um, equations or closed form analytical equations you can use for these. And when what's, you know, to make things more interesting or more complex for, uh, depending on your point of view, every fastener, even from the same manufacturer and the same family, uh, you know, will have a different performance value. So it's always uh, good to use uh, tested data. All right, so assessment documents also cover deviations. Let me illustrate this with a few examples, you know. One of the example is when you when you when the contractor or installer is drilling uh, it on site. Um, you know, the contractor is using the the right installation guidelines, but the only thing is that they're using a, an older drill bit. So what happens when uh, when drill bits age is that they become smaller and smaller. So what ends up happening is that you you get a smaller borehole, um, and and the idea is you know what happens to the performance of the first in this scenario question, right? So another scenario is, let's say if we apply more or less torque that's stated in the ETA, 
what happens to the performance then? If it's, I can tell you, if it's under talked, definitely it will not perform up to expectations. And if it's over talked um, beyond a certain limit, well, you can have spalling of your concrete. So uh, for, for use conditions on, on, on the right hand side, uh, what happens, for example, after 30 years uh, of, of installation when a crack runs through, when a crack intersects the anchor? What happens to the performance then? Uh, and sudden, and imagine that you have an earthquake where the same crack opens and closes uh, several times, and and you know what would happen to the anchor's performance under that scenario? And and so that's the idea: the assessment or the the testing criteria. It acts as proof that the fastener is robust under these conditions. So let's have a little um, let's play a little game. For example, you know, like at this point, think. Uh, look at these three fasteners and, you know, we're, we're using them to connect our, you know, um, our, our steel beam to a concrete column and we wish to do it under seismic conditions. So just, just think about, you know, which anchor uh, would work under these conditions. So black, blue or red, you know, just easy, uh, easy to, to check. So what I'll do is I'll, you know, I'll give you 10, uh, 10 seconds to put. One is approved for uh, seismic, one is approved only for static conditions, and one is not approved at all. So let me just see if you can, uh, if you can just type in uh, uh, your answers and don't worry about being incorrect. That's uh, not a problem <laughs> one bit. Uh, I can tell you when I was uh, quite confused uh, in, in the past. Uh, so we get, we're getting some, okay, blue for seismic, some say red for seismic, uh, blue for, ah, okay, blue for seismic, uh, okay, uh, so we're getting some. Uh, uh, Mr. Amol, your presentation is not on the screen now. Yes, yes, that's fine. I'm, I'm just trying fine. to read the chat at the same time. Fine, fine. <laughs> uh, seismic blue to be more suitable. Okay, all right. Um, so no, no matter what you are writing, uh, it's, it's fine. Let me just share my screen again, no problem. Uh, okay, okay, so uh, no matter what you selected, right, it, it's perfectly all right. So it's actually the red one. and. Uh, you know, it, it's virtually impossible to tell. You know, you might say, yeah, but look at this, you know, little complex geometry on the sleeve. Uh, you know, these two aren't that complex. You know, this might give you some indication or if you've used the similar anchor in the past, you might say, yeah, well, this works. But visually, if I came to you with these three, you would have, um, and, and you were seeing it for the first time, you couldn't tell. So this is where the ETA really comes into play. That's what you're looking for. And so beyond just the design, uh, the, the Eurocode also offers engineers guidance on specific requirements before and after the design of fastenings. And what do I mean by this? Uh, so if let's go back to our example. Let's say we've selected uh, uh, the, the red anchor in, in the last slide, and uh, we, uh, we've selected it based on the ultimate limit state conditions, the serviceability, the durability, all the things we spoke about. And then we design with the Eurocode, uh, Eurocode 2 part 4. We need to translate this intent into the site. And this is where specifications come into play. Now, specifications, as you can see from the middle and the bottom uh, left image, uh, you know, when you put it on your GFC drawings, uh, there are some there is some guidance on how you can do that to uh, really clear up a lot of the, the the misconceptions and you know it, it just really makes your specifications crisp and um, gives the project team so the project manager the contractor really crisp information on what to what to purchase what to how to install it and so on and another thing is the the before design what assumptions we make and uh, the assumption is that the concrete will crack over the service life of its uh, um, you know over the over the structure service life and what do i mean by this i don't mean a crack section i mean that this is the maximum crack width of 0.3 mm that's permitted under is uh, 456 closed 35.3.2 and it's the same in Eurocode except you have a table so based on uh, um, you know you can go up to 0 0.4 under certain exposure conditions but let's stick to 0 0.3 mm so that's the most common one uh, regardless so this is what you have right and so the uncracked model assumes that you will never have any crack um, you know that your cracks will always be 0, 0.0 mm throughout the service life now I don't know about you but I've feel that's quite, that's quite unlikely to be the scenario. 
right? So uh, another thing, once you, just to jumping back into uh, specifications, is that the original designer's verification and approval is needed. So whoever designed it, let's say you're trying to replace one fastener with another, the contractor comes to you and say, hey, I have a cheaper alternative from company Y, uh, or the same company with the cheaper one they're giving me, okay. Uh, what steps do you take then? Well, the idea, the ideal scenario would be to design, uh, redesign it, and and then see if it works. And only then uh, does it make sense. You you have the full uh, confidence that it will work, and I can replace it. So th th there are some some steps that you can uh, take. All right. Uh, let's look at the scope. I, I won't go through the entire standard as you know, it would require a lot more time than what we have today, but I'll illustrate uh, some uh, changes and additions brought about by the previous generation, that's the ETAG001, and what does the Eurocode 2 or EN19924 offer you? So the first thing that was done is, uh, you know, the, uh, is to expand the scope uh, from the C2025 to C5060. Now, this is simply uh, your M25 and M60, right? So just, you can follow the second uh, uh, number. Now, unfortunately, that's still capped by the EAD scope. So all the testing for fasteners right now, it's still restricted to uh, M25 and M60. Those are the ranges. And uh, these hopefully will be expanded in the future. So the, the Eurocode 2 4 has really enabled uh, that possibility. So uh, if you can, obviously interpolate between these grades, but you cannot extrapolate on either sides. And, and, and you know, with the amount of high performance concrete here, uh, what do you do in that sense? Let's say you have um, M, M90 or M95 grade concrete, right? What would you do in that case? Well, the conservative approach is to use the same data for M60, the same ETA data for M60 and apply it here. Um, on the other hand, you know, since the EAD scope is still capped here, there are some manufacturers who have technical data for certain anchors uh, beyond on, you know, on high strength concrete. You know, it's just there, there have been a few tests conducted. Yes, it's not on the same level as the EAD, but you still have values that can be used in design. So if you're really looking to optimize your anchors for high strength concrete or on the other hand, low strength concrete, then there is some guidance available too. Okay, um, one of the big changes is, this might not be um, uh, new to you, uh, is that the Eurocode uh, 2 in particular is based on cylinder strength. And uh, what the standard, the new standard has done is essentially be, become in line with that. Now, what impact does it have on the fastenings? Well, uh, there is no major change, right? So there can be some reduction in concrete relevant failure mode. So that's your, cone breakout, edge breakout, uh, and bond failure as well. There is a little bit of a, a reduction that you might see, uh, but you know you can always guard against this. And there are ways in which you can uh, not make that happen. So it won't always apply. So don't take it that, oh my God, my uh, existing um, uh, designs, they're not, you know, uh, they will give you me lower resistance. No, that's, that's not the point, uh, that won't happen. Okay, so the, these are the factors that have changed. So the, is essentially the these uh, FCK prime, once you reduce it uh, for cylinder strength, these K1, K3 factors have been increased to compensate for that drop. Otherwise, it would make no sense to have uh, reductions. Let's now jump into the tensile resistance. And I'll have to speed up a little bit because uh, you know I'm, I'm slightly running over time, so do pardon me. So there are some changes here. I'll quickly jump on to, I have slides for all of this, so it's better if I jump into all of these directly. So the first factor is the Psi MN. And uh, you know, previously there was research data available for this, but there was no acceptable design model that engineers could use. So what's happening here is that you have a bending moment on a steel, uh, you know, on, on a steel base plate, on a, on a fastening. And what that's doing is generating tension and compression on the concrete. So this, con this compression is actually pushing back on the concrete cone. Uh, so you can gain benefit from this in the sense that you can improve your resistance. And so that's given by the fact that Psi MN. And uh, this is a 1.0 conservative assumption. If you don't want to take its impact into account, you just assume 1.0. And uh, if you want to, uh, take its impact, uh, then if you don't meet these scenarios, I repeat, if you don't meet these scenarios, then you can um, 
dive in here. So this value is between 2.0 and 1.0. So anything above 1.0 tends to increase your resistance. Anything below 1.0 tends to decrease your resistance. And where can this help you? Well, if you have deeply embedded fasteners spaced closely together with large bending moments, then yes, this factor will come into play uh, and provide you with a positive benefit. Next, and, and okay, so before I jump into the next, let's have a quick look on how this uh, translates into a design example. Uh, you know, previously with the e-tag under the same scenarios, uh, I know this is not the highest load you would face on a, on a, on a column, let's say, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, let's say if you translate this into a Eurocode design, uh, something that was not passing previously or not, um, uh, you know, you would have failure, 101 is considered to be a failure, anything over 100 is a failure, and now you have 66%. So that's that's just down to the impact of, the, uh, of this moment factor. So quite useful. The second one, I highlighted that creep was quite, uh, you know, relevant and uh, the collapse, the unfortunate collapse brought about this change. So back in 2008, two years after the collapse, there was an amendment made that, you know, that all uh, chemicals must go through testing. Uh, and what this was essentially is just a pass and fail. So there was no additional thing you had to consider from a design angle. Well, that's changed with your code 2.4. So now there is a reduction factor that you see. So I'll quickly dive into it. There is a reduction factor that's 0 0.6 by default. So if you're, and manufacturers can test for this, uh, for this reduction, right? And if they have let's say you're using a default value of 0 0.6, what this means is a 40% reduction on your um, bond performance of your single anchor. Now, how does this work, right? So uh, is it a default that applies all the time? Well, no, this has to do with the concept of sustained loads. So sustained loads are essentially, you know, your, your permanent actions and the permanent component of variable actions at the ultimate limit state. So essentially you have a ratio here called alpha sustained. Now, if this alpha sustained is uh, is less than psi not sustained, and what is psi not sustained? That's the motor specific factor. That's the 0 0.6 I'm talking about. So if this ratio is less than or equal to, then you know there is no reduction needed because you know your sustained load will never reach that uh, level. But let's say all your loads are sustained. That means alpha sustained is one, and the psi not sustained is 0 0.6. You will have a corresponding reduction of 40 percent. That's the big thing. And you can see where th this might be relevant, particularly in overhead fixings, but essentially any fixing that's subject to sustained loading over its lifetime. Now, manufacturers can test for values higher than 0.6. This can be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and this is published in the ETA. Let's have a quick example. Let's say I have on that same uh, steel column, uh, steel beam to, uh, to concrete column example, I have uh, two load combinations, one of which gives me an alpha sustained value of 0.88. And on the right hand side, you see that I have used one of one chemical mortar, which has an alpha sustain, which has a sustained load factor of 0.88. So in this case, it's zero, it's one, so no reduction. But the second load combination, which gives me 0.95, and correspondingly, I plug it into the numbers and I get a 7% reduction. This is my decisive combination and this is what I need to use. So that's the big change. Third change is you can now install your uh, fastenings in even thinner concrete elements. And that's simply down to the fact that the thickness uh, required of your existing member um, is no longer twice the embedment depth of your anchor. So let's say you have an anchor that's embedded at 100 millimeters into the concrete, that would require at least 200 mil of concrete, uh, I mean, which would be there in most cases. But let's say you're trying to fasten it on a slab, which is 150 thick. Well, as long as it's uh, greater than the minimum member thickness required, again, this H min is published in the ETA. As long as it's anything higher than that, you can now make it work. So particularly for fixings on, let's say, slabs or walls, and if you're really going deep, it's now giving you that freedom to do it. And splitting failure checks, you know, if, you, if you're putting in, if you're designing reinforced concrete, you will need reinforcement. So that means you will adhere to the 0 0.3 mm crack width limitation. So that also means you can, uh, you can ignore one failure mode. So you can, you know, be more efficient with your design. So that really helps uh, you know, simplify the design procedure. 
lastly, this is supplementary reinforcement. Now, this what is this? Now, supplementary reinforcement is nothing but the existing reinforcement in your concrete. And, you know, it's known by everyone. You know, we, we also used to get quite a lot of comments in the past saying, hey, why can't I leverage it? It's so, so densely reinforced. Uh, well, now you can do that under the new European guidelines. So previously, you know, um, fastenings without supplementary reinforcement, normally you have concrete uh, cone breakout being the decisive failure mode. And what happens in this case is that you never truly, um, you know, utilize the high performance of, uh, let's say, the steel. Uh, or the bond or the pull out of the fastener, the fastener's inherent properties. You're limited by your concrete um, cone breakout, right? And and with supplementary reinforcement, we're talking about any underutilized reinforcement, right? So anything which has, let's say you've you've designed the the steel for yield, but uh, you have an uh, it's utilized only eighty percent of its full capacity. Well, in that case, you may be able to use it, and it can be included if certain detailing requirements are made. And you can find these under section 7.2.1.2 of your code 2.4, right? And, and the way this works is using the Stratton time model, forces from the anchors are transmitted into the rebar, right? And uh, you can do this provided there is, again, sufficient reserve capacity. And there are two failure mechanisms associated with this. One obviously is the yielding and the other one is the anchorage pullout or the, let's say the bond failure of the existing rebar, right? And, and both, uh, uh, I mean, these are not new equations. What, what's really happened is it, they've taken the equations from your code two, the main part of your code two and just reconfigured them. So nothing new here, but employing this really optimizes the fastenings if you can, if you have sufficient reserve capacity. Let's quickly move on to shear. Uh, now shear, I won't cover the steel failure with lever arm uh, scenario because it only applies to uncracked conditions and, and unless you're designing temporary fixings such as strutting or valer beams uh, for, your, for your massive civil infrastructure projects, uh, then this would not really apply. Uh, so I'll just skip over this for now and I'll go through the main one, which is the edge breakout. So edge failure tends to be, again, the most decisive one uh, for fastening subject to shear and close to an edge. And uh, the first scenario is when you have a lever arm uh, or a standoff scenario very close to an edge. Now, the, the standard doesn't explicitly exclude it, but it also doesn't give any provisions if you include it in your design. So it's a bit of a gray zone. And what you can do is apply an EJ and apply similar, an engineering judgment, sorry for the abbreviation, an engineering judgment and apply the same provisions to this uh, scenario as well. And, and, and so you can overcome that slight limitation. Uh, was it there in the previous ETAG? Yes, that same gray zone was there, but I wanted to just make it uh, make uh, engineers aware, aware of this because we have a lot of uh, grouts that are quite, uh, quite thick and these create a standoff condition. And the next one, and this is where uh, the, you know, in, in one of my earlier slides, I covered how edge failure starts at a certain distance, um, uh, you know, at a certain embedment depth. And this is 12 times the diameter in, if you're using an M24 anchor or lower. And uh, why is this the case? Well, honestly, although you can install anchors up to 20D, in this failure mode, you can only use 12D for the, uh, the effective embedment. That's the deepest value. So let's say you have an M20 anchor that you're using and you're embedding it at 20D. For tension, yes, you can use all 400 millimeters of that for the concrete cone and the bond failure or the pullout. You know, if you're doing chemical, it's a bond failure. But when you calculate the shear failure, you can only use 12 times the diameter of that. So that would be, um, you know, the, the, the 240 mil. And and why is this the case? Well, quite simply, it's, it's just a limitation in the testing data. Uh, I, I hope in the future this will be expanded uh, because there is testing data with 16 times the diameter as well. Uh, right. So, uh, and this is really a minor impact, I have to say, because most of the ETAs already come with that data and it's already plugged into uh, many of the design softwares that are available in the market. So nothing explicitly that you go out, have to go out of your way to consider. 
Uh, then we take into the effect uh, the edge reinforcement. Now, this is not the sub same as supplementary reinforcement. This is the one that you have close to the edge. If you have uh, closely spaced ties and stirrups, so previously in, in, in the ETAG, you could take advantage of the, if you only had edge reinforcement, now you must pair it with ties and stirrups in order to, um, to activate the 1.4. This means a 40% increase to your edge resistance, and this is quite significant. So if you can plan your post install fastenings, assuming that's the case, then uh, you can really leverage this uh, significantly. All right, and, and the last one is the change in, in essentially when you have edge, uh, I mean, you have a shear force that is parallel to an edge. Right, so let's say we have the same fastening, uh, our steel uh, beam on a concrete column. You have two parallel edges there. And what essentially hap is happening is uh, there is a bit of, um, let's say, stress in the concrete that's generated here. And uh, if you can follow my cursor, and that initiates the failure mechanism uh, that would happen. So what's essentially changed is that the 0 0.4 factor has become 0 0.5. So what this means is a little bit of a reduction when you have such scenarios, but typically uh, this, this wouldn't really apply. So it's not really noticeable, I'd say. Now, we also have supplementary reinforcement for shear, and it works on the same concept uh, as the tension one, except all your shear forces are converted into a tension using a little lever arm. So this ES is your eccentric distance between the, the rebar and your applied shear force, and this creates a tension in the rebar. Now, interesting example, when you have tension and shear, uh, and you want to use supplementary reinforcement, the it will be, it's not like you take it as a standalone. You can, you know, your tension will add to the stress on the rebar, your shear will add to the stress of the rebar. So you're getting a double whammy effect here. So that's the only thing you might want, you, you would have to consider. Uh, otherwise, if you're using, let's say 50% of your reinforcement, then, uh, then yes, of course, you will have sufficient reserve. All right, lastly, uh, for the for the edge, uh, for the interaction. So again, this is extremely helpful because previously uh, you use this failure envelope for combined cone uh, checks. What we do here is you have uh, a trilinear graph or a, a hyperbola over here. And uh, what, what happened with the EAD, with the ETAG, sorry, is that irrespective of steel or concrete failure, it lumped everything together. So in the sense that you were getting quite a conservative design. Now with the Eurocode, your steel failure intention and shear is separated. So that means you take the, the, the steel failure intention and shear, you plug it into this equation and, and then you, you'll get a value less than one. If it's more than one, obviously you have a failure. And, and concrete has been separated a bit. So now you have, uh, if you follow this dashed and dotted line, that's essentially what the steel uh, failure curve looks like. The envelope, I should say. So you want to be on the left-hand side of this envelope, uh, not on the right-hand side. And the concrete, you have this trilinear uh, graph, uh, trilinear curve, right? Uh, and let's take an example. And in this example, you can see, and it doesn't matter what the loads are, essentially, if we, if you are, uh, we're, we're outside the failure envelope described by ETAG, but we satisfy the condition for your code 2.4. Uh, Mr. Amol, sorry yes. to break your flow of uh, your speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, now that we are more or less going to exceed the time, so three to four minutes would be fine to wind yes. up? Yes, that would be okay. fine. And we give uh, more time to the you know, listeners to clarify their minds. Yes. I know your presentation is very elaborate, very interesting. But <laughs> sure. limitations no to everything. No Thank you. No problem. So uh, with this, uh, you can see that it works. And uh, another example you can see here uh, is that even though with ETAG, you were up to 96% of the overall utilization, what happens with your code to four is, uh, is the values go down. The, the utilization goes down. Big benefit for engineers is that it gives you more wiggle room to optimize the fastings. You can bring the fastings closer together. You can potentially reduce the embedment and really optimize those designs. Um, so on installation, I, I, I'll, maybe I skip this. Uh, if you want, I can cover this in the Q&A. Uh, essentially, the ETA also has installation instructions. All the data that you get in the ETA that you use for design, the way it was installed, 
is mentioned in the ETA, the way you do it. And that's what we do to uh, achieve the design of the quality. You follow these steps, scan and drill to make sure you don't damage the existing concrete, clean the hole after you drill it, inject uh, if, uh, and set, and then torque the anchor. And you can also mitigate uh, uh, your risk of poor installation and you can provide instructions in, uh, in, in your specifications or, or GFC general notes uh, on how to use, um, uh, you know, preventative measures for uh, good installation. So you can, there are installer trainings, then there are risk-free installations. So this is a summary flow. Uh, you can, if you want, you can take a snapshot of this. Essentially how it works is you design all the way from design to installation to certification uh, of the anchor. Uh, and, and that's what you can use here. So what are the resources that you can use from design? So where, where do we go from here? Well, firstly, I'd, I'd like to um, really showcase the book written by uh, my colleagues, uh, Kamalika Kundu and Prashan Sate. And this book essentially is aimed for practicing engineers. It's aimed for students. It, it's aimed for academics. And it's, the, the idea is to disseminate knowledge on fastening through a fair and unbiased perspective. And the book uh, contains several real life cases provided by uh, structural engineers uh, across India. And uh, what, uh, you know, it, it recognizes the lack of, uh, of of like a, a textbook on this on this topic. So in the chat window, I think if you go to the very top of the chat, there should be two links. Uh, the first link is for this ebook, and I'll again during the Q and A, I'll post this in the in the chat. And the next solution is the software. So you know all this complex design I was talking about. Uh, uh, every manufacturer should be able to provide you with the working software to to ease your design. Right. And, and uh, for Hilti, that's the Profess Engineering Suite. And now it is also equipped with IES 800. So you can design your stiffeners, your base plates, and your welds alongside the anchor in one, in one package. And lastly, we have the, uh, our, uh, an online community platform that you can always go and post your questions, uh, view webinars on a regular basis that we do, and read articles that we periodically write. So with that, um, you know, Thank you for listening, and I hope, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope uh, this was uh, arousing your curiosity a bit. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Singh. Really nice presentation, and good thing to hear. And of course, I think uh, uh, Kamalika Kundu is not here, and Prashant Sathe, I'm not sure, but not in the panelists, definitely of Zoom. Uh, but anyway, good that you have released this book today formally. And very similar is the code that is uh, being prepared and is being finalized in BIS for all the, uh, I mean, uh, for design, for uh, for construction. That means for installation and for testing of these. Uh, the good thing to hear was that uh, there are certain fasteners which are applicable to seismic, certain not. This implies that the fasteners are okay with seismic. Some of them. Yes. Very good to hear that. And of course, it has ETA approval. That's about the highest level of approval one can have. European yes. technical approval document. Which they give you a lot of details as to what all you need to do, what all your materials should be, what all installations you have to follow. It's a very elaborate document which may be running into 8, 10 pages. So once they approve, then obviously there's no doubt left. Yeah. Okay. So I'll request uh, our president, Mr. Manoj Mittal, to, you know, give his reactions on this uh, presentation because he has been spearheading lots and lots of such uh, technical webinars. So, Mr. Mittal, please. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vinay. Uh, really, it was a very fantastic uh, presentation uh, by Mr. Amur Singh. I know him uh, very well and uh, uh, we have interacted many times and he's a very knowledgeable uh, and also very good speaker. So it was a very effective presentation on post installed uh, uh, fasteners. So uh, because as, 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 as you also said earlier, that this is a very important aspect for all the structural engineers to know what are the various type of uh, uh, fasteners, how they can be installed, and what is the theory behind that and principles behind that? That is also very important to uh, for engineers to know, and uh, how to calculate that. And 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 now they have the software, and they are also 
coming out with a book and pi is also uh, coming out with a uh, standard so uh, i'm sure it will be very nice and very uh, uh, useful thing for all structural engineers and really hilti is a very uh, good company actually they they are very supportive they always uh, whether the work is small or big they are always available for uh, all kind of support technical support commercial support any kind of support uh, anywhere in india i have found i am using their products actually quite uh, and many other projects so uh, i am very impressed with the hilti so i am really very happy that hilti uh, associated with us uh, for this uh, uh, presentation for this webinar and also they are releasing, releasing their book uh, uh, by uh, uh, ms kundu and prashant sathe and uh, i am really hopeful that that book will also be very uh, useful to all structural engineers uh, thank you amol uh, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with all the students thank, thank you thank you thank okay. you much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mithal. So, Dr. Vizalakshi, would you like to add something? And from your uh, what is it, academics perspective, I must say. And of course, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Vinay. Yeah, thank you, Anmol, for enlightening us uh, with the different types of fasteners uh, which can be used. From the academic uh, perspective, I think we need to include these as a separate module. in our steel structures and the rcc structures okay that we have to include that and thank you for elaborating and uh, explaining in a very very easy manner how these fastening fastenings work and uh, i hope the book which you hilti has launched will help out the field engineers for a better structure yes. connections Thank, thank you, you Anu. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaurav Kashik. Would you like to uh, uh, say something on this uh, presentation we had? Sure. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation by Amol, as usual, and uh, he has really uh, clarified on a lot of the topics which are of relevance in the country because in the absence of a formal book or a formal training on the subject. uh these kind of uh, lectures webinars do uh, create that kind of uh, you know sharing of knowledge which is very important for the past uh, engineers and uh, engineering community so that's right it. right 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 no of course you are a person from hilti so certainly you're not supposed to ask any questions <laughs> you're supposed to only respond and anyway, my request now is that i'll take up the questions one by one and uh, i'll request anyone if you to please feel free to reply to the questions so first and foremost is uh, dr sushil dhawan he is uh, just finished his uh, phd about couple of years ago at the age of i think 78 if i'm not wrong or maybe 75 so he has a few questions explain the principles of fastening system i think uh, mr uh, singh has done it very well the principles are already explained but his important question is life of these fasteners in uh, say yes. marine areas or something like that yeah yeah so uh, when you are designing call it life call it performance both yes yeah I- i'll call it durability right yeah. Uh, yeah. and and that's that's uh, essentially that's built into the fastener when you uh, when the eads roll out so the all eads have a provision for 50 year testing and 100 year testing that's for the performance aspect now the 100 year testing is only really relevant for uh, chemical anchors uh, and uh, for let's say you're using in a marine environment uh, the best the first most important thing is understanding the corrosion risk over there what type of corrosion environment you're in so if you follow uh, one of the one of the key guidance guidelines on this is the ISO uh, 9223 and i believe that gives you guidance on uh, which and envi- how to categorize the environment and once you categorize the environment it tells you what material to use and this is going to be not unique to 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 anchors this is also for your steel structure uh, as well so mostly if you're in a marine environment the the lowest grade you want to go is with a stainless steel and that's on the 316 category or the a4 depending on uh, on what system you use 
And if you if you have something that's submerged, or let's say you're using it even though in a marine environment, but it's quite, um, let's say it's quite a corrosive atmosphere, you might want to go with high corrosion resistance uh, in that case, which is a step above your stainless steels. Right. I hope that answers that question. I think certain, uh, yes, certainly. Thank you so much. Certain questions have been answered apparently by one Shonak Mitra. Yes. He's, a, he's a colleague of mine uh, from, okay. uh, from India, uh, one of Gaurav's as well. So, That's yes. why they're exactly hitting on the nail. So <laughs> I was wondering who this person is. <laughs> is yes. he from BIS or he or she, of course, I do not know yes. the gender. He, or yeah. from uh, <laughs> Hilti or some or some competitors. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Sean okay. a, Sean, Sean a very knowledgeable colleague uh, right. of mine. Yeah. So we have a question from Mr. Abhishek Kumar Singh. Uh, does these anchor affect or affect the strength of main member? Because during process of anchoring, main member may be uh, so main member may get uh, some micro crack as it may reduce its strength. So any views that you would like to throw, please. Yes, yes. So uh, every time it does, because all you're doing is you're adding, you're adding tension, you're adding shear. Mm. Uh, and let's say you're adding shear, that's going to go into the, the effect of, let's say, you know, the example we used in the webinar was a, a steel beam to an existing concrete column. What you might want to do is you want to see uh, what's your uh, column capacity, what's your concrete capacity, and can the transfer of loads exceed that capacity cause the member the concrete to fail if not well, then you then you're, you're perfectly fine with that and any micro cracks yes well we all have to live with that as long as your reinforcement can limit it to 0.3 mm and then i think you're you're good yeah. uh, no uh, i think question is a little different slightly okay. a okay. question is not original cracked concrete that anyway you consider in your yep. factors of safety etc you know it very well mm -hmm. the question is the person during. feels that during the drilling process, I see, I see. concrete that, may receive cracks. So do you think that uh, you know, the kind of process that you use for drilling this uh, concrete can uh, entail any cracks uh, yes. because of drilling exactly. or because of tightening? Yes, that is, uh, thank you for thank you for that. I think I get the question now. So uh, when when we uh, we have minimum uh, uh, edge criteria in, in mentioned in the ETAs. We also have uh, the techniques used to drill. And one of the techniques that I, I, I think I skipped over was, you know, when we, we scan before we drill, one of the ways to minimize the amount of cracking and spalling that you would have and damage to your existing concrete would be uh, by, you know, aimlessly drilling and hitting rebar. Well, that's not going to be ideal. So you also want to uh, be sufficiently far from the edge. If you're installed, if you're drilling too close to the edge, again you'll spoil the concrete. But with the micro cracks, uh, then then yes, the the same. A little bit, uh, it will happen, but it won't spoil your concrete. There will be some cracks, yes. Uh, and and I'll maintain that uh, once the drilling process is done, uh, it 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 should be fine. They they so will be. So in nutshell, these cracks, which may occur post-drilling or even they were there earlier as RCC is cracked, yes. they are already accounted for in the design calculations. Yes, yes. So Only thing one is to ensure that the concrete is of certain quality. It cannot exactly. be that you have honeycombs or pockets and things like that. Yes, exactly. Any honeycombs will be, uh, will be will even just propagate cracks even more. It will be detrimental no. to the member. Yes. And uh, that is why uh, when we scan uh, the member, we actually find out where the reinforcement is and it's very important to not uh, damage the main reinforcement of the member. Right. I'll ask a very critical question. Somebody has nicely asked and please don't feel embarrassed. No. Is any practical example of failure of Hilti fastener material oneself, or some itself, whatever? Yeah. Um, Yes, there have been uh, a, a couple. Uh, I, we, you know, we won't deny it. Let's, we will be very honest. Gaurav and I can be honest about it. Uh, and um, the fact is, you know, there has been a failure. Uh, again, I, I don't know all the details of this case, but apparently, six months after it was installed, uh, it, the, you know, there was a collapse of, uh, you know, this was uh, again steel plates. And uh, you know, installed with post-installed. Uh, I think they were either mechanical or chemical. I can't quite recall. And after six months, there was a collapse of a portion of a slab. Now, luckily, no one was hurt. Uh, we, I don't know the exact cause of failure, uh, whether it was uh, down to poor installation or poor quality control on on our side. 
And I, I think there has been a thorough investigation of that. Uh, uh, Gaurav, would you care to elaborate a little bit um, if, if it's okay? Uh, Amol, as far as I recollect, it was on uh, a poor installation, uh, which caused the uh, member to have that kind of a and this is a very uh, important point. Uh, thank you for bringing it up. I mean, we don't shirk away from it. And we also consider it a responsibility to train uh, contractors and installers and at least supervise a couple of the initial uh, things. And uh, and one thing we have to ensure is that it's, we also have to acknowledge that for the installer, drilling and cleaning all these holes is quite a tedious task, not in terms of just time, but in terms of the labor, the manual effort. Sometimes we don't recognize that. And along that journey, there, uh, you know, you have chances of poor uh, installations that can occur as well. So that's also the aim of, um, of Hilti to provide tools and not only get the job done faster, but also get the job done without any installation mistakes. And one of the tools we uh, we we really we really like to harp on about and really talk about is is a hollow drill bit. So it, it drills and using a vacuum cleaner, it sucks out the dust at the same time. So this means that for chemical anchors, there is no barrier uh, in the load transfer into the existing concrete. So you save time. Yes, and that's important for the installer. But from an engineering perspective, you also get a peace of mind that, oh, yes, the, the thing is, is being done. And what's crucial is you can write all these installation steps in the general notes of all your drawings. And, you know, you can give guidelines on, hey, this is the, the best way to install it. Um, and, and hopefully that will make uh, life a bit easier. Mr. Gupta, if I would just add, you know, like, we may design the best of structures, best of buildings. But at the end of the day, it is that mason over there and the bar bender who decides how good a structure performs. Finally, after yes. <laughs> right, right. That's true. Yeah, okay, so, another so, very so useful when question. I, when I, when I just, uh, I want to add that really, that is why it is very important for uh, structure engineers to learn uh, installation procedure also and what are the precautions to be taken in installation, not only the design. Uh, exactly. you, you will write notes on the design, the drawing, that's okay. But installation is also important. So as an engineer, as a structural engineer, probably you will like to educate the site supervisors or the client or the installer that there is no mistake at site. So this is, a, this is very important for structural engineers to know all these processes actually. And, and once I believe all, uh, once the industry, you know, once this whole um, um, pandemic scenario is gone and once, you know, I mean, I don't know about other, other practicing engineers, uh, but I really feel that I haven't been able to visit any sites uh, in the last year. Uh, I don't know about you, but if you can, please uh, do do a range of visit when some of these anchors are being installed. It, it'll really, you know, you just have to do it once. And trust me, once you see the thing in action, the entire visualization process really helps you appreciate, you know, where, where the contractor also struggled. So uh, if you can, once in the future, things open up. Sites but do, do you have Hilti uh, certified uh, uh, installers? Applicators, uh, yeah. Applicators or? Installers? There are some applicators, yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, another thing we we're, we're doing, and I can give you some context from other countries, like Singapore, for example. Uh, and you might, uh, it might be worthwhile that there is a, a government uh, initiative or a government requirement to have certification for all posts and sole fastenings, not just for anchors, but for reba as well. And then there's a mandatory requirement on, on the amount of pullout tests that you need to conduct. So uh, with the certification concept and with the pullout test concept, the idea is like you have a double shield that uh, can can mitigate failure. So it may be worthwhile for local um, building authorities to consider this. Um, you know, at any point when we when we run into post and solve fixings, we want to make sure it's installed by a competent person. So we help train. We're doing this uh, in 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 other countries. In India, also we do it, uh, and we we do demo. I have done it myself. Uh, in 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 May, 40, 45 degrees, gone to a site and and installed it. And I can tell you, it's it, it's no easy task in that heat. But uh, uh, I'll put it like this: it is the owners who are indirectly responsible for failures of fasteners or anything for that matter, because in the tender specifications they many times or most of the times forget to write the requirements like in for special uh, items like this, call it pre-stressing, call it fasteners, call it uh, you know, something of the other kind, say bearings and expansion joints. 
the specifically trained uh, personnel of the manufacturer who is an expert in the field should be available during all the operations related operations at the site the constructor the contractor may have to pay additionally for that but then the quality is kind of ensured but somehow that's where we uh, many times i would say not always fail to incorporate such a comment but anyway let's go further i'm sure many people are waiting for the answers to their questions uh, interesting question is how well do the fasteners perform under cyclic loads yeah. for example when you use a fixing bay fixing uh, use it for fixing uh, a base plate of a motor a really good question on this hmm. uh, firstly i i want to emphasize that mr arun kumar ganasekaran yeah uh, thank you mr ganasekaran for this uh, there's a, this this is a very interesting question so there is a you know it, do you, do you have the cycles for your loads that's the first important point if yes if it exceeds uh, 10000 load cycles then ideally one should design it for fatigue applications for fatigue loading scenarios and the second part of that is do you have the delta uh, of the tension and the shear so this you have the static component and you have the fatigue relevant component if you have those two then yes there is a separate ead So again, you can't use the same EAD for static and seismic. You need a separate assessment, uh, and, and you need a fastener that's approved for fatigue. Again, so we follow the same steps. We have the loads, we do the design, uh, and your code two four gives you basic guidance. But if you're looking for more advanced guidance, there is a, there is a technical report published by EOTA, the European Organization for Technical Assessments. Uh, it's called TR zero six one. and that if you just do a quick google search you'll find the pdf document on how you can design on that so yes um, they will perform the cycles that are considered for 50 and 100 year testing are mostly for static and anything that you need that needs a fatigue in your case for example a base plate or motor would need a fatigue design so fact is there is a method of design for this yes. fatigue when it goes beyond 10000 cycles so that now the designer has to choose uh depending on the conditions of particular motor or particular exactly. vibratory loads of any kind yes yes all right very good thank you so much another very interesting question from sathota murlali dharan is that these fasteners they are metal and you put them into concrete metal absorbs more heat with this latent heat or whatever that is so is it any effect of this extra heat that fastener will be hotter than the concrete around Mm, no not entirely concrete's very well uh, well in, in insulating so that will not be the case and yes for chemical fasteners this is a very good point mechanical fasteners are not you know the they're, they're not that sensitive to heat but chemical fasteners yes if over the lo- long term and long term is generally 6 months of more of continuous temperature let's say above 45 or 50 degrees uh, then yes your chemical uh, uh, fasteners will start to lose bond strength and this is captured in the ead so most manufacturers they have they test to uh, two or three temperature ranges in in that there's a short term that's mostly for installation that doesn't have impact on the design and then you have long term and long term if it's generally above 45 50 degrees then you take a lower bond strength in your design all other parameters are are, are unaffected here so that would be the design uh, implication on that good thank you Mr. Achyut Ghosh, you may be knowing, he is praising you for your presentation, rather you. excellent presentation, in very many ways. I need not read every line and every word. And he's also saying, yes, failures, yes, when they take place, we learn from the failures, which is also a well-known line. But uh, he is complimenting you for accepting the failures and then saying what to do for the failures. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. We have another one from Mr. Praveen Chari. Which software is best result? for steel structures well uh, i think there are many other <laughs> learned members in the audience who have used different softwares i have only been familiar with the start pro during my time on your side of the table uh, and and i i'm sure there are others okay this the software is best for connection design for steel well so <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good one actually um, <laughs> i can tell you internationally uh, many engineers use tecla steel for mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. some of them use so idea statica is another company which provides software specifically on connections 
And if you're looking for, uh, and that they and they have both Tecla and Idea Statica in their softwares have uh, cast in fasteners represented as uh, members you can just plug and drop in. Um, now uh, I have to also add a point with Idea Statica is that we worked collaborated with them uh, for the Hilti Profess engineering uh, software, particularly how you can design your connection. Uh, for not just the, the post install fastener that's provided by Hilti, but also the base plate, the stiffness, the welds, but not the profiles. I have to be very clear. Uh, the steel element, that's the job of you know softwares like StatPro, and we're not aiming to replace any of those. We're just providing that you take your inputs from StatPro, for example, you can design the post install connection, and in the future, we're also introducing a cast-in option with this as well. So you can take your, uh, um, you know, cast-in anchors that conform to a certain requirement and you can design your base plate, your stiffeners, your welds alongside. Um, I don't want to say it's the best, but uh, we, we do have an option for you to pick. And, and there's a link in the chat uh, for that. I must tell you that you're receiving several uh praiseworthy statements in the chat box you in a free time you must read this or get a recording of this thank you people are very happy about this presentation yeah. okay so i think uh, we are coming to the end of uh, the written questions uh, so mr manoj mithal would you like to conclude as president because you are really spearheading so many of these technical events and your popularity of IES Trakti, the webinars of IES Trakti has gone up like anything. And thanks to the entire team, including Dr. Vizalakshi, who is from Hyderabad, also helping out so very well all the events. And of course, Mr. Alok Bhamik is probably not here and many others. So thank you so much. So Mr. Mittal, would you like to? Okay. So uh, actually, I am not uh, the person who is organizing all those things. Basically, there's Alok Bhamik, who is the chairman of uh, this profession development committee. Sir, it's under your umbrella. Don't forget. Oh, oh, that's, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh that's that's okay. So, see, uh, yes, uh, IS Trek is a very uh, active and dynamic active body, nice. and right. we are doing a lot of quality work. Actually, we are we are very vibrant body, and we are doing a lot of technical events, quality technical events. They have rich contents, and uh, we are doing a lot of publications also. So, we are doing a lot of things which are really important and meaningful to uh, structural engineering fraternity. So, uh, so first of all, so, uh, I have already uh, said that this is a very fantastic presentation and we are very happy that Hilti associated with us uh, for this kind of presentation. And so I am sure that our structural engineers who have joined today, they must have benefited from this presentation. And, and I am sure the YouTube recording of this will also be available uh, to all our members who have not joined today. So they will, they can also listen to it. So it will be very helpful to everyone. And I will also at this uh, today, I would like to uh, request all the participants who are not the members of the IS Trakti that they should become the members of IS Trakti because by joining the IS Trakti, you will feel much more involved in the activities of IS Trakti and you will also be able to uh, contribute uh, meaningfully uh, to the fraternity. And I think this will give you a lot of satisfaction apart from doing your professional work. Because when you work for somebody else or work for, work for others, you get satisfaction. And once you get the satisfaction, you will feel happy. You will be you will be at peace and you will be very happy. So this is a very important thing for everyone. So I request everyone to become the member of IES Trakti. And uh, uh, further, uh, uh, we, are, we, we have already started a refresher course on uh, structural retrofitting which is already in process. Tomorrow we have a lecture uh, session on it. And uh, national awards uh, have already been uh, announced. Uh, national awards 2021, they have already been announced. They are in various categories like uh, outstanding structure, uh, outstanding structural engineer, outstanding pro uh, promising uh, young engineer, woman engineer. So MTech thesis. So we have four or five categories, uh, and uh, we are aiming that they will become a very prestigious awards one day. And last year we started it, and Dr. Professor Prem Krishna is the chairman of this committee. So uh, it is a very prestigious award as such, and we are doing a lot of uh, we are getting a lot of entries, and uh, those who want to participate, who want to nominate, they should uh, do it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, everyone.
Visalakshi, no. you can. Visalakshi can, I think, uh, con uh, conclude it by vote of thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, uh, before giving the vote of thanks, uh, I would like uh, the Hilti people to let the participants know from where they can access the the book which has been launched. Yeah, so uh, I think there are two links that if you see in the chat. Uh, one you have of already them, provided? Yes, they are there. Okay. So the, there is a link to the ebook, and then there's a link also to the, the Profess Engineering software um, for you to use. Yeah. So both links have been there. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Hilti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gaurav. I think it's a very long process. Uh, which we have undergone to get this webinar uh, to the conclude session. Uh, so that right? it was a pleasure to uh, bring this uh, webinar to uh, everyone through your uh, platform of IS Rakti. And our aim is always to share knowledge and uh, help the engineering community to make bigger and better structures. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaurav, for approaching us to uh, for the for this webinar and also for the launching of the book which would benefit the structural fraternity okay and uh, thank you mr anmol for a wonderful presentation uh, as it is uh, uh, seen from the messages which you might be receiving in the chat box mm -hmm. okay there are various uh, praises which you are getting in the chat box well, thank you thank it's, you it's and very humbling. we hope to see you again on the highest tactic platform Thank you. Always happy. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Vineji. As usual, you have moderated perfectly the session. Huh? Thank you so much. Hope to thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, participants, for joining the session. We wish that uh, you would uh, also do participate in our future sessions and refresh your courses. The, member, the participants who are not a member of the IS Turkey, the link for the membership is provided in the chat box. You can go through that link or visit IS Trucky webinar and become a member. Thank you. Thank you all. See you next Yeah, time. so I would like to thank one more person. That is the uh, that is Mr. Vikas Verma, who's a backbone huh. of this organization, <laughs> I must say. The right, exactly. person is there yeah. 24 hours a day. You call him and he does the work. Uh, He's, of course, uh -huh. uh, manager of uh, IS Trucky as designation. But he's available all the time for yes, everything yes. and so many webinars, so many events. We are tired, he's not tired. So, Mr. Yeah. Verma, would you like to say something? Yeah, sorry, Vikas, I forgot Just you to mention you, sir, because <laughs> we take it for granted. Vikas ko hum granted le le te. <laughs> no, no, Vikas, give one or two comments of yours about IES Trakti and his people. Yes, Vikas. Two lines, man. Just thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Vikas, is really, Vikas is really doing very good. He's a very hardworking person. <laughs> very hardworking person. I know him for a very long time when he joined yes. IS Trakti. Yes. So, since so many years, uh, he has picked up a lot. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy take weekend. Care. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, everyone. everyone. It was Bye. a pleasure.